Morning everyone. In this video we're going to have a look at the difference between transparent watercolour pigments and opaque watercolour pigments. Is there that much of a difference between the two? And if so, is it something that's very important? Is it going to have a significant impact on the way that you paint watercolours? I've got two different tubes of watercolour pigment here. First is gamboge hue, and on the label it tells me that it's transparent. The second pigment is French ultramarine. But curiously, it says that it's opaque. And we all know that watercolour is a transparent medium, so what does this mean? What's actually going on here? I'm making this video particularly in response to questions that I've received from you in the last few weeks and months. Thanks very much for sending them in. Because a lot of you seem to be unable to connect the way that I paint and the finished article of my paintings with the colours that I use. Let me give you an example. Cobalt blue and light red, both of those are opaque pigments. And so I've had questions like, um, Oliver, you use such opaque pigments, but your paintings still look fresh and transparent and vibrant. I don't quite understand why that would be. Or I see that you've got yellow ochre and raw sienna in your palette. They look very, very similar colours to me. Why, why do you use both of those? Is there any difference between the two? And Oliver, I've noticed that you use um, quite a bit of cadmium yellow and lots of cadmium red, particularly when you're making shadow colours with French ultramarine or cobalt blue. Surely you would end up with muddy paintings, wouldn't you? You may have had this experience on a watercolour workshop where one of your fellow students comes up to you and says, yeah, I see you're using um, cobalt blue. No wonder your paintings look muddy. Not entirely helpful, but we've probably experienced something along those lines. And you then think, oh no, I've, I've made a muddy painting and oh, quite clearly it's because I'm using the wrong type of pigments. No, it's not. It, it's actually got almost nothing to do with the paints that you're using or how transparent and opaque they are. And I want to show you that. I want to show you what is a muddy painting how we arrive at making muddy paintings and that the fault doesn't lie with the type of pigment we're using or the manufacturer whose paints we're using either. I'm going to do a few quick exercises. Uh, let's get stuck into it and I'll show you what's going on. Okay, so here's my palette from a bit of painting that I was doing earlier. As you can see, it's in a, a real mess. I haven't bothered changing the water. I'm not necessarily suggesting that you do that, but it will serve to illustrate a particular point. And I'm going to start off with um, these two chaps here, raw sienna and yellow ochre. Now, De La Rowney suggests that raw sienna and yellow ochre are both transparent. Well, in my experience, the yellow ochre seems considerably more opaque, and that is why I use these two colours, because they're, they're very, very similar and they do different things. Raw sienna, being more transparent, is very good if I want to uh, make a glaze, which is a, a light wash over the top that of, of something that I've already painted. Uh, but they're very, very similar in, in many respects. But I just want to do a little exercise with these two uh, colours and um, show you how they behave and whether or not the more opaque yellow ochre uh, leads to duller, more muddy paintings. Incidentally, uh, Windsor and Newton refer to or classify yellow ochre as semi-opaque or semi-transparent, so it's not a precise science. So I've cleared a little corner here. Um, let's start with some yellow ochre. And I'm just going to make some random shapes on the paper here. be anything. Trees, bushes, that type of thing, or just abstract shapes. I'm 
going to mix in some um, French ultramarine. And of course, French ultramarine is an opaque colour. So no doubt we're going to have a, a dull, lifeless little area on the paper here. Well, we'll see. Let's put in a little bit more ultramarine, just for the fun of it. And these colours, you can see they're, they're mixing on the paper. This is very wet. I'm using lots of colour here, lots of water and a large brush. Now that's really important and you will see why shortly. As that's starting to dry, I'm going to do the same thing here with some raw sienna, a more transparent colour, in my opinion. I'm using a smaller brush. And we'll paint a similar kind of shape to that. Let's add some ultramarine in. And you might be asking yourself, why is he painting like this? I mean, seriously, does anyone really get a small brush like this and sort of scrub the paint on like that? Well, yeah, they do actually. And I come across this from, I say from time to time, regularly in workshops that I run. I come across it in uh, videos people have made of them making paintings and I come across it even in some tutorials that I've seen um, people making online where your brush is too small for the area that you want to paint, you're not using enough wet paint and this scrubbing action essentially drives the pigment down into the surface of the paper it doesn't allow watercolour to behave in the way that it ought to behave, or it behaves best, which is for the uh, pigment granules to be suspended in lots of water, to run together, to mix, settle, and just sit on the surface of the paper. That's not happening here. Uh, because I'm not using enough water, because I'm using too small a brush, this area here, even though it is being painted with a more transparent pigment, is starting to look a bit scrubbed, starting to look a bit muddy. I want a bit more area over here because I'm going to paint on top of that in a minute. And of course I'm exaggerating this to an extent because I, I, want, to, I want to show you what's going on here. So there we are, there's my two areas painted and I'm going to let those dry. Now what I've done is I've just painted over the top of this. I didn't show you because it's exactly the same as what we've done before. Small brush, not enough paint, still with raw sienna and a bit of French ultramarine. And I then mixed some uh, French ultramarine and some cadmium red and put that as a, a shadow area on the field. Hopefully you can see this, but it looks absolutely hideous. It's scrubbed and dull. There's no transparency here whatsoever. And it really does look a mess. And this is causing a lack of transparency in your painting. And you might say to me, well, what do you expect, Oliver? I mean, you've used, <laughs> you've used French ultramarine, you've used cadmium red. They're two opaque colours. You're just going to get an opaque mess. There's absolutely nothing you can do about that. Well, we'll see. I contend that the reason it looks like this is not because of the colours, but because I used too small a brush, not enough wet paint, and 
the way that I had painted in the first place of scrubbing it on, it disturbs the surface of the paper. So the sizing, which is the treatment the paper has to give it resistance to paint and water, has been disturbed. So when I paint over the top of it, it doesn't behave how the paper ought to. It sucks up too much pigment and you end up with this, this rather hideous mess on the paper. What I'm going to do is paint a similar area on here and show you what it can look like. But what I'm doing here is I'm actually going to my more opaque yellow. So let's mix up some yellow ochre, some French ultramarine, and paint another row of trees. I'll drop these on here. You can see the paint is going on much nicer here. It's flowing still within this wash that I've created. There we are. I'll mix up some more shadow colour. The dreaded French ultramarine and cadmium red. Absolute nightmare. Why would you ever want to use these horrible murky colours. Well, here we go. Here's our shadow colour coming underneath here. It's a bit wet, but you kind of get the impression of what's going on. Now, as that's drying up, we're going to descend into the murkiest of depths we possibly can by creating an absolute slurry pit here on the palette. And let's see what that looks like when we paint with it using a large brush and lots of watery paint. And then let's see what it looks like with exactly the same mix when we don't use enough watery paint and we scrub it on with a brush. So I don't know, let's let's just let's just create something horrendous here. Let's let's get some let's get some cadmium yellow. That's a that's a really good opaque colour. Bit of cobalt blue, bit of Payne's grey, bit of cadmium red, bit of yellow ochre. Bit of ultra, bit of everything. You know, I'm I'm doing the things you should never do here. You should never ever make this kind of mess on your palette. Apparently, um, even though many of the old masters said that their best greys and browns came from the uh, residual paint that was left hanging around in the corner of their palettes. Hmm. So that looks pretty. That looks pretty disgusting, right? Let's let's put a. Let's put a earth colour in here. Let's put a bit of burnt umber in as well. Now, here we go. Let's put this down on the paper. And the fact of the matter is, despite it being horrible and grey and not very bright and colourful, the way I'm putting it down on the paper right now, I'm all right with that. It looks, it looks quite nice and transparent, funnily enough. And it's looking okay because I'm using a large brush, I'm using plenty of liquid paint, and I'm letting it settle on the surface here. Now, that's okay. What if I then put some I don't know, light red into it because that's that's another that's another good opaque colour that of course we should steer well clear of. Let's just drop some light red in here.
Okay, there we go. Let's let that dry and then let's go back to our smaller brush and paint a similar kind of shape. Red in there too. Now I'm hoping you can start to see the difference here. Um, it may not be too apparent on the camera and that's why you should have a go at an exercise like this yourself because by playing around with the paint, having a look at its properties, seeing how it behaves, seeing how it misbehaves, you will get a far better idea than any classification on the label what a paint can do for you. And there we are, using exactly the same pigments. This looks scrubbed because it is scrubbed. It doesn't have the transparent quality that this does. This is showing some nice granulation where the pigments have been suspended in lots of watery paint. And you start to realise that the problem is not the paint. The problem is me. It's the way I am applying the paint to the paper that is an issue. Now, for sure, there are certain pigments that are more transparent than others. And I'm going to show you that in a minute. But it is in varying degrees. And the differences between the transparent and opaque pigments really isn't as significant as you think it is. And just look at this. It is quite evident that it is technique that is the issue here, not the equipment. Let me give you another example. I've painted what could be the front of a house here in yellow ochre and just suggested some windows and a door. And then there's a white building next to it with some windows. I've done the same thing here. What I want to do is put a shadow across. Um, I'm, I think I'm going to put one across here that would be underneath the roof. And then I'm going to assume that somewhere here that there's a building or something casting a shadow across the side of this building and maybe across the front here like that. And I'm going back to some of my favourite murky opaque colours of um, French Ultramarine and Cadmium Red, which I love for this, these types of shadows. And I just want to show you how it looks when you paint it with a decent technique. So a large enough brush for the area that you're going to paint and plenty of wet paint on your brush. Here we go, let's imagine that the shadow runs along here under the roof. And yeah, let's see, it could be coming down most of the building here. And then let's have it falling across the building in front. Notice I'm working down the paper as always with plenty of wet paint. Nice enough large brush. I think this is a size 10 sable for those that are interested. Let's just have a look at this for a minute because 
if you read the labels on the tubes, we've used some opaque colours here, uh, French ultramarine and cadmium red. But you can quite clearly see the yellow coming through the shadow. It's turned this into a sort of biscuity brown colour. You can see on the white building next to it, that purple shadow colour. It's quite distinct from what's next to it because it is still transparent. We can still see what we painted underneath. We've done it carefully with a large brush and used lots of paint and we haven't disturbed what we had painted previously, the yellow and the windows and the doors. How much more transparent do you need your paint to get? Now we're going to do the same thing on the uh, building here, but we'll go back to the more questionable technique of uh, using a small brush and not enough paint on it. Shadow along the top. And then we want to come down around here. Something like that. When you paint like this, you tend to get a lighter result because you're eking the pigment out further across the paper. So you can see that this is less, slightly less in tone than the painting next to it. And in my mind, I think, oh, I really, that's, that's a problem. I, I would actually like that to be quite a bit um, darker. So I'd better go into it and put a bit more dark in there like that. There we go, lovely. Maybe some more up here. And before you know it, look what's happened. This has turned into a horrendous mess. In fact, it's so scrubbed on that it's disturbed the yellow and it certainly disturbed that dark colour for the windows and the doors. It just doesn't have the same granulation to it that we've got here. And you can still just about see the difference between the two, but it's, it's not the right way to paint. Now, nothing's changed here in terms of the pigments. We're using exactly the same French ultramarine cadmium red, but I've used a smaller brush with not enough paint on it, and that is where the dull, muddy painting comes from, not from the paint. I've painted a red square here. Uh, permanent rose was the colour I used, and I'm just going to paint some cadmium yellow across it. Again, another of these horrible opaque colours, and just have a look at the result. Medium strength wash of cadmium yellow, So you can see quite clearly here, the cadmium yellow, where it's on top of the um, unpainted paper, is cadmium yellow. And across the permanent rows, it's turned into a nice sort of peachy orange colour. It's very easy to see the difference. And despite this being an opaque paint, it is still quite transparent. And it's certainly transparent enough for me. I don't really need my paint to be any more transparent than this. Let's try another from the rogues gallery of opaque paints, cobalt blue. Lovely colour, but it's opaque, according to the, uh, the charts and the manufacturers. 
Here we are. Nice wash of cobalt blue. And you can see where the where we have the white of the paper, there's cobalt blue. And across the permanent rose is a nice violet colour. It's still transparent. And the problem comes when you pick up a wrong piece of advice, whether it's on a workshop or watching a tutorial or you know, speaking to another friend that paints, and they tell you that, well, it, it, you're not using the right paints. You're, you're using the wrong sort of pigments and they're not transparent enough. Well, yeah, that might be part of the issue, but the real issue will be you're not painting with the correct technique, as we saw here. And the problem is you then think, well, Ugh, my pigments aren't right, so I'll start changing colours. You, you see, that doesn't work. And then you think, oh, of course, it's the manufacturer. I've got to go to a different brand of paints. It's absolute nonsense. You don't. Nail your technique and you will find that the paints will do what you want them to do. And despite being opaque, are remarkably transparent. Now, I don't want to really labour the point anymore, but I just want to show you this little chart that I made up earlier and have a go at doing these because they're great fun. Get a uh, permanent black marker, make a couple of lines on your paper. Of course, it needs to be permanent. Let it dry. You're going to be painting watercolour paint over the top of it. And then what I've done is I've just painted mainly yellows, but uh, I've included a couple of blues at the end over the top of the black bar. And it shows you the extent to which they are transparent and opaque. Now, starting at this end of the scale, the transparent end, and these are these are medium strength washes that I've put on the top here. First is raw sienna. Um, you can see a little bit of uh, the raw sienna on top of the bar here, despite the fact that it's very transparent. You can still see that. Gamboge hue, hardly any trace of it there at all. Cadmium yellow, again, very, very little trace of it, despite being an opaque colour. Yellow ochre, I can just about see uh, a trace of it there, but again, not much. Naples yellow. Now, Naples yellow is an interesting colour, and it is one that I would say you shouldn't use if you are glazing over the top of other things in your painting. No matter how good your technique is, it will start to look quite dull because look at the um, chalkiness of the pigment here. It's, it's by far the most opaque and you can see that across the black bar. I love using Naples yellow, however, painting wet into wet skies. Have a look at this painting here. You can see, I mean, the yellow goes down first of all, so, so there's no real issues there with it making anything underneath it look muddy. But I like to drop in clouds, warmer clouds, cooler clouds mixed with blue and cadmium red into that sky. And it creates wonderfully soft colours and they hold their place on the paper well, too. And, and I love it. I, I would not do without Naples yellow uh, as, as one of my most important paints. But this is the issue. Just get to know where you should and shouldn't use it. Not good for glazing. Fantastic for, for skies. This is French Ultramarine and Cobalt Blue. Again, they're both opaque colours apparently, but there's very little evidence of that on top of that black bar. Same thing here. I've just painted these uh, a lot stronger. And you can see here that the if you look at raw sienna and yellow ochre, there is a little bit of a difference. I would say yellow ochre is fractionally more opaque, but it's it, it's not a major thing. I like to use yellow ochre because, again, when I'm working wet into wet, mixed with French ultramarine or Payne's Grey, it really grips well without spreading out all over the paper if you haven't quite got your timing right. So it's, it's a forgiving paint in that respect. Look at Gambo's hue, still beautifully transparent, even though we've painted that quite thick. Cadmium red, you can see it's there's a bit more opacity there. Naples yellow, very, very chalky again. But look at the blues, the, these horrible opaque colours. They're not at all, they're wonderful. 
French ultramarine, cobalt blue, very little evidence on top of it, or on top of the black bar here. Do one of these, do it with as many colours as you like, and you will notice which ones you feel are going to work for you. Don't worry about the fact it's got opaque written on the tube. Just think about where you may or may not be able to use that in the context of your painting. I really don't need my watercolours to be any more transparent than that. And that's as much thought as I'm going to give the matter. Well, I hope you found that helpful. I hope that's given you a little bit more understanding on the difference between uh, opaque and transparent pigments. Hopefully you've been able to see that, to be perfectly honest, it's not that important. And the problem in our painting, and in particular when we create paintings that are dull, that lack vibrance, and that are muddy, it's not the fault of the paint, and it's not the fault of the paint manufacturer. It is our fault. It is an issue with our technique. And try not to spend too much time getting caught up in over-analysis on, on things like uh, paints and brushes and paper, and as interesting as they are. Everything that I try to do on the channel is um, what I would call real-world painting. So I'm interested, really, in what a painting looks like at the end. And I think, to be honest, most of us are. There aren't that many of us, I don't think, that look at a painting on the wall and go, oh, I can just see how wonderfully transparent the raw sienna is in Mr Turner's work. Really? Of course not. You just go, wow, that's a stunning painting. It's a little bit like when you go and have your fish and chips on the quayside. How many of us will say, well, do you know, that was really good, and I think it came down to the molecular structure of the potatoes in particular, and, and the, the sodium level in the salt w was absolutely spot on. I don't think we do. I think we just go, wow, that was a delicious portion of fish and chips. Thank you very much. Now, if you've enjoyed watching the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please subscribe too. That's always extremely helpful and very, very much appreciated. Get yourself a piece of paper, have a go at creating some of the little scenarios that we did here. Try and paint some muddy passages on the paper. Try and paint some beautifully glowing, vibrant passages on the paper too. But have fun with it. Observe what you're doing. Have a look at the way that paint's behaving as you're putting it down on the paper and once it's dried. In the meantime, take care and I will see you next time. <laughs>